Welcome everyone. Good afternoon from Pinehurst, North Carolina. Thank you guys so much for joining me again this afternoon. I'm so excited to have you guys back. I had such really heartfelt emails from so many of you this week telling me how much information you got out of our first session and that you were inspired to find out more information about your stroke history. And that just really means so much to me because really the whole point of this is to put this information into use in your life and make it personalized. As we were getting to know each other um, last week I asked you guys to contemplate um, reaching out to your providers to find out where your stroke was and I know many of you have done that so what I wanted to offer you I just had this idea yesterday is if you are comfortable with me sharing my interpretation of your MRI we could actually start off every recovery group by going through someone's neuro image and demystifying some of the words that are in it and getting through some of the jargon because it's very difficult to understand exactly what it is um, that they're trying to say in these reports. I wish they would have a doctor's interpretation and then a patient interpretation after it so we could actually understand what these things mean. Wouldn't that be a good idea? So again, welcome back to so many of you and any of you that are new. If you missed last time, um, we're able to get you on the replay. So based on our last session, I really hope that you did a lot of thinking and a lot of research about your stroke. The purpose of rule one was to really start to get you to wrap your head around the idea that the stroke happened to you as a whole person. It is very easy to medicalize the stroke, to really focus on the physical issues that are related to the stroke. And what I wanted you to do was start this stroke recovery journey with me, kind of really taking a bird's eye view. So the first thing that I wanted you all to do was to actually get some information about where in your brain you had your stroke, okay? And what I wanted you to do um, was to see maybe if you could get some medical records from your doc if you could try to get a CT scan, if you could try to get an MRI of the brain. So that way you could at least have that information. You can send it to me and I'm able to help you make some sense of it. But at least we could uh, start the process of understanding exactly where in your brain you had the stroke. The next thing I encouraged you to do was find out why you had your stroke. If they know any of the risk factors uh, that put you in that category, it's important for you to know because that really can help you with secondary stroke prevention. The next one was encouraging you to figure out where you might need a new assessment, an updated assessment, to really, again, try to take that bird's eye view and figure out how your whole person was affected by the stroke. Sometimes you have to go back and really think, okay, you know, socially, how have I been affected? You know, maybe there is a cognitive element here that I really haven't focused on because I've been so focused on my walking or my leg. And I really wanted you to take all of it seriously and to validate for yourself all the things that have been impacted. And the last one was asking you your reasons for being with us. I hope that you do find this to be quite educational and informative, but I also wanna make sure that you are very clear on your why. What exactly is your motivation for wanting to be with us? So what I'm actually gonna do, oh, let me back up here. Okay, uh, what we're gonna do now is a really awesome, wonderful friend of the I Care For Your Brain program, Mr. Jerry Wald, who has an awesome uh, Facebook group called Let's Talk Stroke. Um, he actually sent me a CT scan and he has given me permission to talk about it here on our recovery group. And I'm gonna start today by going through it and kind of interpreting it for all of you so we can all start to demedicalize this whole stroke thing. So what Jerry sent to me was actually a CT scan and this was the only one he had available to him today. He might get me one closer to the time of his stroke, but this one I'm gonna interpret for you is what we call an interval CT scan. And what that means is it's a time two, so we're comparing sometime in the future after the stroke with the CT scan from the time of the stroke. And the reason we do that is to assess for interval change, meaning we wanna see have there been any other strokes, but we also wanna see what is the extent of the original stroke? I've shared with you guys that unfortunately, sometimes in the few days after a stroke, we do 
actually see a little bit of a spreading of the damage. And so if we do a CT scan or an MRI scan a few months later, we're actually able to really get a handle on what was the totality of the stroke? How big is it? Uh, what brain areas does it completely encompass? So a CT scan, I kind of think of it like a little bit of a grainy black and white photo, whereas an MRI of the brain is kind of like a clear, crisp black and white photo. So the reason we do CT over MRI is a few reasons. One is we call it kind of a quick and dirty scan, meaning if you're in the emergency room and they need to find out you know, within 15 to 20 minutes that it takes to do the scan, if you've had a stroke and where it is and if you're bleeding and how much you're bleeding and if you need an emergency brain surgery, it's great because you're kind of in and out. It's also a lot cheaper than an MRI. So a lot of times if the docs feel like they can get away with the CT scan, they're gonna do it depending on what the referral question is. It is, um, as you guys know, if you've had one, you go into a machine, it's based on a special X-ray technology. And what it really helps us do is identify where in the brain things are happening, but it's not a super crisp, clear image. So when Jerry sent me his, what it talked about was the after effects of the stroke. So this isn't uh, exactly what we talked about last time, meaning find out where you had your stroke. What this is actually showing is the after effects. So what Jerry Stroke uh, goes into in the findings section is that he has evidence of what we call left frontal lobe encephalomalacia. Now encephalomalacia is one of those inaccessible words that if you don't know what it means, you're looking at it like it might as well be Greek to you. What it means is it's the after effect of what happens to brain tissue after a stroke. And the way it looks on a CT scan is kind of like a blur, kind of a little bit fuzzy. And all it means is that that brain tissue, which for Jerry is in his left frontal lobe, is unfortunately kind of turned a little bit soft, which is an indirect sign of showing damage. So the things that we care about from this CT scan are exactly where in the brain Jerry has had his stroke damage. So this is telling us it's in the left frontal lobe. So the left frontal lobe, what we know is that it is most related to language and the use of our right hand. It also can get back a little bit into the temporal lobe, which is related to memory. So that would be the direct damage that we get from Jerry's CT scan. But when you know about the brain, if you recall from session one, we talked about the fact that there can also be indirect damage. And this is where a neuropsychological cognitive test really comes in, because that's really the only way to understand what has been the indirect damage of this stroke. So what I would imagine from knowing that Jerry has this damage in his left frontal lobe is he might actually have some trouble with the functions that belong to his right cerebellum because we know that the brain networks in all humans' brain are in the series of interconnected loops and the left frontal lobe and the right cerebellum are interrelated and share responsibility for things like word finding, multitasking, uh, sometimes also kind of... Uh, emotionally being able to put the brakes on what you're feeling or what you're expressing. A lot of times uh, CT scan reports often go into things that you might not think of as being related to the brain like sinuses and I just wanted to touch on this quickly because Jerry it does mention in here that I think you had a little bit of a sinus infection when you had this. Two points I want to make about this. Oftentimes the only information patients get about their brain scan is related to what the docs went in looking for. So in this case, Jerry's docs went in because he was having some seizures and he was having headaches. So of course they wanna see, is there another stroke going on here? What in the scan might explain Jerry's symptoms? So they might have told you, Jerry, about the encephalomalacia in the left front part of your brain, but they might not have mentioned that you have a sinus infection. Now sinus infections are really important to know when you have a brain injury because the way you might think of a sinus infection is that it's simply the sinuses are right here and maybe a little bit up here. Like sometimes if there's, you know, a storm coming in or, you know, it's that, you know, time of the month, I might get a little bit of head pressure and I feel like it's my sinuses and I kind of push here and it makes me feel better. But that's just one part of the sinuses. The sinuses are an unbelievable system all throughout our whole head, even all the way up into the back of our skull. And so if you have a sinus infection and it goes untreated for too long of a time and it's in one of the sinus pockets that's back deep up in the skull, I have seen these things unfortunately reach into the brain. 
you do not want that to happen. So when you get this uh, CT MRI report, if there's something in there about the sinuses, advocate for a referral to an ENT. They're the ones who are the docs who are experts in sinuses and, and get the sinus infection treated because it could be adding to your fatigue. It could be adding to your headaches and those things are very important. So like I said, if you're game and you feel comfortable, uh, I'd be more than happy every time we do one of these recovery sessions, we could start off with a brain scan and I can kind of walk you through it and help you understand it. That would be my pleasure. Okay, so what we talked about in rule one is making your map and what making your map means is pretty straightforward. You need to know exactly where you're at now and you need to know exactly where it is you want to go. And this can relate to any post-stroke symptom you have. And the way I want you to think about this is that this is your precious recovery. This is maybe the most important job you've had yet in your life. This is something to treasure. It's something to respect. But if you don't know where it begins and you don't know where it ends, it's going to be very easy for you to get discouraged to lose your way, to not keep your eye on this job that you have in front of you. Stroke recovery is made up of three different types of interventions, and the people who get the most well combine these interventions and figure out which way works for them. The first one we talked about is the actual physiological repair of damaged cells, and this is how we often think of things like neuroplasticity, that you're actually regrowing brain cells, which really what's more accurate is that you're trying to rebuild the connections between brain cells. The brain cells at the very top have these dendrites where they collect information. They then summarize it, figure out what the message of that cell is, and then they shoot it all the way down the axon and they communicate it with other brain cells with the little wiggles that are at the end of the brain cell called the synapse. So really what we're trying to do with neuroplasticity is grow more dendrites and grow more synapses. But there's really two other types of recovery as well. The first one is learning, pardon me, the second one is learning to compensate. So what this means is you can teach other parts of your brain to do the function that the damaged part used to do. Okay, this is also a form of neuroplasticity. You can also learn to compensate with external strategies. So what we talked about here is like calendars, you know, using different kinds of shoes, really basically a workaround or kind of finding your way to get to the same end goal, but maybe through a different path. And the last one that I do think we need to respect and bring into the conversation is acceptance of changes. We also talked about the bigger your stroke is, the more damage you're gonna have, the longer, more difficult your recovery could be, and the more likely it is that you may not return to full function. And if, if we don't talk about that in a recovery conversation, I think that we're setting people up for an extended period of grief. And I would love nothing more for all of you to have an absolutely perfect recovery. After seeing hundreds of thousands of people who have lived after a stroke and are surviving and are thriving, the people that do really, really well have worked hard on acceptance. And what I need you to know is that acceptance, acceptance does not mean giving up. And we are gonna talk about that as we go through this journey together. We are gonna talk about how you can soften into some of the effects of this stroke, but it doesn't mean that you're gonna fight it any less. It doesn't mean that you are not gonna come at your recovery with an incredible tenacity. It just means that you're not going to waste energy on being extremely, resentful about what has happened. And, and that is quite the journey, and we are really gonna get into that. All of these types of recovery require neuroplasticity, and that is really the function of this stroke recovery group. Neuroplasticity happens when we rebuild and rewire brain networks. Now, if you recall what you learned in our last session, are all brain networks the same, or are my brain networks different than your brain networks? Absolutely. The brain is organized into countless interconnected personalized networks of brain cells, but here's the thing. They're based on life experience and no two people's lives are the same, right? So they become more complex over time. They're based on things like our early education is very powerful, our interests throughout life, our hobbies, and our relationships. And knowing this, that brain networks are unique, 
that is a great insight into how we can push your personal recovery along. And that's really what rule number two is all about today. So remember last time we learned that in a stroke, either the network itself or access to the network has been damaged, right? So just like with Jerry, we know because he had a left frontal stroke that he is going to work with right-sided weakness, maybe some language problems from time to time. But again, he might also have some indirect damage, which could be related to that right cerebellum. So this is an important point of hope, I think. Please remember that for so many of you, a stroke is a focal injury. There are other big areas of the brain that remain healthy, as healthy as they were on the day you had the stroke. And the reason that this is important to know is because Networks, which represent our knowledge, which represent how we know how to do things, our understanding of things, they are, as pictured in this graphic in front of you, they are widely distributed throughout the brain. So that's what we really need to talk about is how do we rebuild all of those little red spots, those little nodes, right? Those little connections between the different uh, parts of the brain. And what we talked about is the neuroscience research that shows that the best way to promote neuroplasticity is really based on two different approaches. Surrounding the person with a complex stimulating environment, right? That's all the active rehab, that's the hard work, that's your PT, that's your OT, that's your speech. But on the other hand, we also have to bring in high quality rest, especially REM and non-REM sleep. So recovery, when it's its most successful, is going to be respecting that we need to bring both of those things into the conversation. So that was a recap of rule one. And now what we're going to do is move into rule two of the interactive stroke recovery guide. And rule number two is building on what is familiar. So let me explain to you what that means. A stroke did not just happen to any brain. I really want you to integrate this into your understanding. It happened to your brain. Your brain has always been unique. That's the beauty of being a human being is that no two brains are the same. Your stroke was very unique. Even though we have common risk factors that this person might have had a stroke because of high blood pressure and this other person might have had a stroke because of high blood pressure, no two circumstances are the same. This person might have never had blood pressure issues before. I've had patients, uh, unfortunately, I'll never forget this one woman who never really had a blood pressure problem before, and she was in her driveway with one of her grandchildren, and unfortunately, one of her grandchildren got hit by a car in the street, and she had an immediate huge increase in her blood pressure and that clot caused a blood clot from her heart to go into her brain and she had a stroke no previous history of blood pressure the other person might have had hypertension since the time they were in their 30s and by the time they got in their 70s that wear and tear just kind of caught up with the brain so every stroke is unique when we combine those two realities that means that everyone's stroke recovery is going to be unique and what concerns me is if we don't really respect this fact we are going to take this kind of cookie cutter approach and apply the same stroke rehab techniques to every person and you're not going to get as much out of your recovery as you could otherwise so what i mean by building on what is familiar is personalizing your rehab, making it your own. So again, cookie cutter rehab where a one size fits all approach is not in line with what the neuroscience research tells us will get you the best recovery. We must personalize your recovery. And like so much of what I try to teach you in this stroke recovery group is that the person who can make that happen, the person who has to take responsibility for that happening, is you it's you and your personal care team this is not the way that insurance-based stroke recovery is going or i shouldn't say it, it's not the way it is now i will tell you i have some hope we're going to actually talk tonight about a few changes that are coming um, from the organization that mandate stroke recovery and what acute rehab intensive rehab is supposed to look like but you're really the one who is gonna to have to push this agenda, who is gonna to have to try to stick with it as best you can. So just getting into this idea that everyone's brain is different, because if you don't buy into this concept, uh, you might have trouble buying into the rest of this lecture today, which is really how are you gonna put this into practice? So what's so cool is that just like your fingerprint is an only you marker of your existence, 
really so is your brain, okay? So the brain is really shaped by, yes, some unique genetic factors that are unique to you from your two parents coming together and the roll of the dice on your genetics, what you got. But really it's our individual life experiences. And the way we first started to wrap our heads around this is there started to be this research in London with taxi drivers. And it was inspired by a brain re researcher who got into a taxi one night and he just started talking with the driver. And the, basically the, the researcher was blown away by this man knew every street address in London, like the back of his hand. He was just so fluent with anywhere that this man possibly wanted to go. So the researcher asked him to be a part of a research study and they started scanning professional taxi drivers and people who you know, are normal, not taxi drivers. And what they found is that the taxi drivers had significantly more gray matter in the spatial cortex, meaning that the more that they use that part of the brain, the more they got to know the city, the more they got to know addresses, the more they actually built up brain matter in their brain. So then they've expanded this research to looking at chess players, athletes, guitarists, Whatever it is that you have done for a long period of time, and, and this is where hobbies really can come into your recovery, your brain is built around that. You have very specific networks that are very complicated with multiple layers, which means they're very strong. They're not necessarily prone to being completely damaged after a stroke because again remember these networks don't just exist in one part of the brain they're very widely distributed right and so knowing what we know about stroke that it's a focal injury a lot of that network can remain and we want to really try to exploit that for your recovery so to put that more simply a stroke uh damaged a specific part of your brain network or networks and the job you have in recovery is really to rebuild it so one of the metaphors i love metaphors in brain health because the language that physicians and uh, neurology likes to use to me are not very patient friendly we could go back to the term encephalomalacia you know why can't we just call that damage or um you know softening of brain tissue encephalomalacia it's very inaccessible to me so i like metaphors because they're more understandable so one way you can think about your stroke is that you are a beautiful house right and a tree came along and fell on the roof of this beautiful house. And that's your stroke, the tree is your stroke. And what you can see here in the picture is that that has crushed the roof a little bit. Some of the windows are broken. You know, we've got some damage um, to, to the different structures of the house. That's what happened to you. The, the house is still standing. The rest of the brain is still there. You wouldn't be alive if it wasn't, okay? So again, really get back into this idea that the stroke is damaged to one part of your brain. It's not the whole part of your brain. And the way we can rebuild this house is by getting in there and putting back on it what was unique to that house in the first place. So we want to match the paint, right? We want to get the same kind of siding that was in there before. If I just go in there and I say, well, my house is brown and I have clapboard on the outside of my house, let me put it on this house. It's not going to work. This house is not going to come back to life in the way that it should because I'm not respecting that that house is unique to begin with. Okay, so this applies to any post-stroke symptom that you are struggling with, and this is what we talked about last time. If you go around that horn and you identify any different deficit that you have, the philosophy behind recovery is you are rebuilding what was there to begin with. And the way you're gonna rebuild is brick by brick. Stroke recovery is a lot slower than we want it to be. And if we don't normalize that, we're gonna be discouraged, we are gonna get depressed and we're not gonna have the energy and the motivation that we need to put into recovery. So I want you to start to think like a bricklayer. This is not something that in a year uh, is going to be over and wrapped up in a nice bow. This is something that you have to take seriously and you have to work at brick by brick by brick. And what we talked about last time is that the strongest adhesive for rebuilding your brain networks is these unique things that formed your networks to begin with, your longstanding hobbies, your passions, your interests, okay? So all the things that make you, you. So if we go back to this idea of being a bricklayer, right? What is the very best glue that we know, the very best mortar, the paste that you put in between the bricks? What is the very best thing that science tells us actually holds things together the best, rebuilds things as quickly as possible? 
It's you, you're the glue, okay? And that's really what rule number two is all about. I want you to bring more of you into this rehab. So let's demystify what I mean by that. Research tells us that when therapies are personalized, people feel more empowered, they are more motivated to do the therapy, and they get better, okay? When your rehab is personalized, you will be more invested in the process and in the journey, and most importantly, you're going to get better results. So what we're gonna talk about today is three ways to build on what's familiar. So what do I really mean by that? First one is we have to talk about how to personalize your therapies. Remember, cookie cutter therapy is out, it's old school. What works for Joe is not gonna work for Steve. Number two, personalize how is it that you get motivated to do your therapies? Stroke recovery is hard work. It takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of effort. If we don't know what are the, the magic buttons to push to get someone to want to do their therapy, we're not gonna get as much repetition out of that person. And that's really rule number three. There's a, a sneak preview for next time. You will not believe how much repetition science tells us it really takes in order to return to uh, function. It's a lot, and there's barriers for that. One of them, of course, is neuro fatigue. We're gonna talk about that in a lot of detail in the future. But I'm convinced that we could also do better here if we personalize how we got people up and running to get them motivated to do the exercises. So we're gonna talk about that today. And the third way you can build on what's familiar is to personalize how you reward yourself after therapy. If you are working so hard in your recovery, but you're not giving yourself rewards, you're missing an opportunity to enhance neuroplasticity because there are chemicals that are released in our brain when we reward ourselves. And those are like fertilizer to neuroplasticity. They give it a nice boost. But also, that is human psychology. If we are working hard and there's not a reward, that's just the way the motivational reward system is built into the brain. That is the way we are designed as human beings. So I wanna to talk to you today about how is it that you can personalize the reward after you do all that hard work. So let's start off by talking about personalizing the therapy. This is fun. This is where we're going to get to, again, you'll notice in our recovery sessions, I'm going to be asking you to do a lot of thinking back before the stroke. And that really is because we're going to use all that information to design your personal recovery and what you're going to do. So this little graphic here is going to be included in that interactive handout that we send you within the next day. But I wanna walk through it with everyone together because um, it, there's just so much rich information here. So what you're gonna do is go through all of these different time points in your life. And I've just broken it up here into 15 year increments. So you can kind of find your current age on here. But what I want you to do in the next week until we meet again, this is your homework, is you're gonna just write down, think back from the time you were born until the time you were 15. What did I love? What I care about is you writing down the things that you were emotionally connected to and the things that you developed expertise in. So when we develop expertise, basically that's telling us that the brain networks are really nice and strong. They're nice and integrated. So the stronger the foundation on the house, the easier it's gonna to be to rebuild, right? So when you think of all of these interests and these passions and these hobbies, we want to get these on the table, let's write them down because we're gonna use them, okay? So I'm gonna teach you in a minute how to do that. So let's just go through, a, I'm gonna pretend that I'm talking about a 77 year old gentleman who had a left middle cerebral stroke, okay? And he has some language issues and he is working really hard to get his right hand back, okay? So we're gonna go through his development and from, you know, young boy until the age of 15, let's call this guy Aaron, okay? From age zero to age 15, Aaron was really, really interested in baseball. His family was uh, Boston Red Sox fans, and he knew all the players, and he listened to the games on the radio, and he just loved it. He played t-ball. He was a shortstop. 
he knew all the plays, he understood the mathematics of how to, you know, uh, understand statistics, and he really identified himself as a baseball fan. So he's got all sorts of brain networks in there that are for Red Sox and being competitive and getting excited and the feel of the baseball and the feel of the glove and the feel of the bat. There's a ton of baseball information in Aaron's brain, okay? Then he gets older and he's 16 to 30. And in addition to a newfound interest in, uh, you know, uh, attractiveness of other people, perhaps he also then develops a really strong interest in cars. He loves classic cars, right? He's really interested in uh, an El Dorado and he knows when they first came out and he knows the best color he loves and he understands about how to drive a stick shift. And now he's got all these brain networks in his brain about cars, right? That is something that a big part of his brain is dedicated to. Then he gets a little bit older, he goes into the lumber industry, and Aaron is a guy that knows all about trees, he knows how you, you harvest them, he knows how you sell them, he knows what you make from them, and now we've got this big part of Aaron's brain that's all about trees and lumber, okay? Then he goes into 46 to 60, and now he takes up golf, he's getting a little sick of lumber, he wants to do something more fun, he's sit a, sick and tired of sitting at a desk, he wants to get out there and actually have some fun. Now he's starting to develop this whole part of his brain that's related to golf, okay? Then he gets into his 60s and he becomes interested in travel. He has been on the golf, cars, golf course too long. He's been at the desk too long. He's been studying cars too long. He is ready to get out and see the world and he wants to go to uh, Israel and he wants to go to Africa and he's got these amazing complex stimulated brain networks that are all about the places in the world that he's been and their culture, right? So this is Aaron's brain. If Aaron has his left middle cerebral artery stroke and we just all of a sudden act like Aaron is patient zero at the physical therapy office in speech therapy and we just start giving him flashcards that we give to every other person that comes in and we don't take into consideration all of these brain networks Please tell me that you can see how dumb that is, with all due respect, uh, and what an opportunity we're missing out on because that card that they're giving Aaron to, you know, do his word finding with, and it's showing pictures of um, kitchen items, you know, Aaron's brain is not built for that. Show him pictures of classic cars, you know, what, what year El Dorado was this? Now we're getting somewhere. Now we've got all this fuel behind it. So what I want you to do is after you do this exercise, you're really gonna go back to all of these passions and hobbies and find a way to incorporate them into the therapies that you or your loved one is doing today. So we're gonna just go through an example, okay? And you know, I live in Pinehurst, North Carolina, which is like one of the hubs of United States golf. So I had to pick golf, of course. Um, so again, this is our buddy who, uh, we're gonna go with our, our guy, Aaron now. He's got the one-sided arm weakness. So again, remember after years of playing golf, not only are his brain networks involved with the facts and his passion, for golf, but these brain networks also have expertise in balance, things that are physical, hand-eye coordination, visuospatial skills, all the memories that he has associated with golf. When he thinks of golf, even though so many people tell me golf is frustrating and it's not as kind of victorious as you might imagine it to be because it's pretty hard, but there is definitely a competitive thing going on with golf, whether it's in a group or whether it's with yourself. I think people who are drawn to golf tend to be pretty um, interesting and competitive people. So when we activate that golf network, we're also getting some of that fight spirit. We're also getting that person who wants to improve because they just are fighters deep down. And we can access some of that by activating the golf network. We can bring up feelings of satisfaction, of victory, and identity. This is something I feel so passionate about is that one of the most difficult psychological things that I think happens after a stroke um, on the person and the caregiver side is that within an instant, identity can change. We can go from being a retired executive to a stroke survivor. We can go from being a wife to a caregiver. And that shift in identity is very rarely validated. It's very rarely talked about. It's very rarely treated with appropriate support and counseling. And that can be very depressing and very 
painful for a lot of people. And so we don't want that to happen. People are not their stroke. You are not your brain damage. You are you. You will always be you, no matter what happens to your brain. And when we can bring back the things that people love before their stroke, we're also saying to them, you are the same and your identity is the same. We're not going to medicalize what has happened to you. We are always going to respect the person that you have always been. So this is just one very simple example, okay? So any of you who worked through you know, spasticity, tightness in your hand, you know that therapy balls can be a big part of your treatment. And so the simple act of replacing a typical therapy ball with a golf ball in the hand to get that fine motor recovery back, this activates the golf network and we're lending, it's kind of like, you know how there's some cars that run on gasoline and diesel, and if you run out of gasoline, it can switch over to diesel? That's how I want you to think about this. Yes, of course, any therapy ball will work and it's good, but if you personalize it and you make it specific to the person, that's the diesel, that's the extra, that's the turbo, and why wouldn't we want to do this, okay? So I wanna give you another example of someone, let's just say now, and I hate to be, um, gender stereotyping, but it's helpful to kind of think of two different types of people. So now we're going to think of a person who has a lifelong love of flowers and is also struggling with aphasia. First of all, how beautiful are these flowers here? I wonder if any of you know what type of flowers these are. These are Dahlia flowers, and that name is very special to me because that's actually one of my daughter's names. I like these flowers so much, I named my daughter after it. So of course, I had to put it in our presentation today. So for this person, they have all sorts of brain networks that are related to flowers, right? So after many years of developing expertise and loving flowers so much, this brain has networks that know many, many names of flowers, the different parts of flowers, memories of how flowers grow, flower arranging, the smell of flowers, the wonder of flowers, how amazing it is to watch something go from a seed to a beautiful blossom like this. And again, feelings of identity. Who am I? I am someone who's had a stroke. No, that is not the total picture. I am me. I love flowers. My favorite flower is a dahlia, right? I am an expert flower arranger. That is who I still am. I may not be able to participate in this activity like I did before, but it is still a part of me, and I still have these brain networks that I need to bring into my recovery. So again, let's go back to the flashcard example. So knowing what you now know about the brain, do you think this person is going to be best supported by using flashcards that have specific flowers on them? Or should we just use the same old stack that we use for everyone who comes into our clinic that, again, let's just say has kitchen items on it, right? No, we have to make it personal to this person because that's what she's interested in, that's what she has expertise in, and we have all of this energy from those brain networks to bring back in. So I want you to think about how this relates to you and use your unique brain networks to power boost your recovery. And what is so important to me is that even though you are working through your impairments related to your stroke, that you do not give up on the things that you have always loved. Not only to me will that hurt your spirit and your mental health and lead to different types of sadness that I do not want you to have, but it will neurologically hurt you if you completely give up on what you used to love because you can't do it the way that you did before, okay? So you really do have two choices. You can go on and find adaptations or you can just give up. But I want to show you what's at stake if you give up. Let's just imagine this is our golf network, okay? If we don't find a way to bring golf back into the person's life, we are now losing the vibrancy and potentially even the existence of this entire network. And this is because the way the brain is organized is use it or lose it. If you don't activate brain cells that have a specific job, they don't want to stick around, okay? And I'm going to share some data with you about that on the next slide. But I want you to meet your recovery where it is. So let's just go through three hobbies, okay? So perhaps before your stroke, you were an 18-hole golfer who walked every hole. I have, living in Pinehurst, I have definitely heard this, that if I can't walk the 18 holes, I'm done. I'm not going back. That would be such a disservice to yourself for all the reasons I keep reiterating. 
What I want you to think about is, could you do nine holes and use a cart? You're still gonna be bringing in all that golf network, all those things I've been teaching you about. If that's not possible, significantly modifying golf might be something like putting just inside your house. Again, holding a uh, golf ball, talking about golf with other people, even something as passive as watching golf on TV, putting it on for the person, this is something that is going to light the person up, even if you can't necessarily see it. I know some of you who are watching, you know, have spouses who have locked in syndrome. Even if you can't see that there is a reaction from the person, find a way to bring back the things that the person have, has always loved because you are going to be able to get more into this recovery. Again, if somebody was a big piano player, Perhaps you can't go back to doing it exactly as you did before, but just even sitting there with a keyboard, feeling keys, looking at those black and white keys lined up, this is lighting up this network. Listening to familiar songs. We're gonna talk a lot uh, at the end of our session today about the power of music. It, if you're not using music in this recovery in the way that I'm gonna teach you today, you're really missing out on a way to power boost this recovery because it's so healing for the reorganization of the brain. Gardening, gardening is actually a pretty physically um, demanding activity. So if you're not able to get there out there and do it like you used to, you know, sometimes getting raised beds put in, doing container gardening, you know, sitting at a table and putting a container of dirt in front of someone with some bulbs, the feeling of the hands back in the dirt, the smell of it, the decision making to decide what kind of bulb you want to put back in there, all of that is power boosting the brain. If that's not possible, you know, asking someone to plant very low maintenance plants that you could enjoy, bringing someone a bouquet of flowers, uh, helping them set up, you know, little seed containers and over time you can see and watch together how the seeds grow. Anything that will bring back people's hobby is not only the humane and kind and progressive thing to do, it's also the most neurologically helpful thing to do. So let's get back to this idea of use it or lose it. So this is very important to know. Brain cells that do not get stimulated, you know what they do? They shrivel up and they basically decide, I don't think I have a job here, and they self-destruct. And the concern is not that that one little brain cell decided that it was going to get rid of itself because it didn't have a job. The concern is that that one little brain cell doing that starts a cascade of neurodegeneration. And the reason we know this happens is related to people not wearing their hearing aids and Alzheimer's. So I wanted to just take a few moments of your time to talk about that. So with hearing loss, we used to think that the problem was um, is that if people couldn't hear, then they withdrew socially because who wants to go to a dinner party when you can't hear anything? And then depression sank in, right? And once people are very depressed, they really stop being stimulated and we can get accelerated aging cognitively and um, there's a whole host of issues that can happen in the brain when things aren't being stimulated. But what we actually know from research out of Johns Hopkins is that's not actually the big contributor. That is happening. But the bigger problem is that cells in the auditory cortex are so specialized. They care about perceiving sound waves you know, and organizing it by pitch, by volume, by melody, by putting it into the sounds of words and helping us with comprehension that if those cells don't have a job, they really do self-destruct. And it's, the problem is not that the auditory cortex cells, um, you know, basically self-destruct. The problem is what happens next. The next door neighbor to the auditory cortex is the hippocampus. The hippocampus, you have two of them, one on your left, one on your right. This is where in the brain we make new memories. This is where Alzheimer's disease sets up. It's very easy to think of Alzheimer's as a memory disorder, but really it's a learning disorder because the hippocampus takes what we uh, experience in a day and turns it into a memory. And when we have cell death in the hippocampus, we are not able to make new memories, and this is what Alzheimer's disease is. So there's a real use it or lose it risk with the brain. If we don't stimulate those networks that have been there for a very long time, decades and decades, they are going to think that they don't have a job and then we're moving the brain in the wrong direction. Everything we're talking about in terms of brain recovery is all proactive, right? Rebuilding, we wanna reconstruct, 
we have to do everything we can to gently push the brain in that direction. That's where your nutrition comes in, your hydration comes in, keeping your blood pressure down comes in. All of these things we want to come together to push the brain in the healing direction. Things that push the brain in the uh, self-destruction direction are not being actively involved in the things you're used to do, having your risk factors get out of control, eating crappy processed foods, right? That's a gentle push in this direction. We wanna do everything we can to go in the more positive direction. So untreated hearing loss, just as an example, is absolutely linked to the development of dementia. If we know that for a fact, we can take that insight and we can apply it to stroke, okay? So I really want you to think about that. Use it or lose it. The next way you can personalize your rehab is how you get motivated to do your therapy. So motivation is a basic principle of rehabilitation and it's one of the predictors used to determine a stroke survivor's recovery potential. The more motivated the person is, the better they're gonna do. The harder the motivation, the less well they're going to do. Now, while most stroke survivors know intellectually all the benefits of rehab exercises, a lack of motivation, especially once you're home or once you're out of the care of a therapist, is a serious barrier to an optimal recovery. Personalizing rehab exercises is one way to help overcome low motivation. Now, I know that so many of you would love nothing more than to participate more actively in your rehab and that the fatigue, the neuro fatigue keeps you from that. So please don't hear me um, as invalidating that or disrespecting that. A big part of what we're gonna talk about next week is neuro fatigue, how to work with it, uh, how to try to, to not let it be a barrier, but even still, there are things that we can do to get ourselves more energetic and more focused on doing our rehab exercises. So the first question that we can use to personalize motivation is just to think about what kind of a motivator are you? There's two types of motivation. The first one is called intrinsic motivation. So this comes from within ourselves, okay? When we are intrinsically motivated, you do your therapies because you enjoy it and you get personal satisfaction out of it. So these are the kind of people that are competitive with themselves. They don't care about winning the game. They just wanna beat their time from the last time they did the game, right? So I want you to think about you or a loved one. Does that ring true for you? Are you the type of person that wants to the only competitor that you really have is yourself, okay? Now, what's really interesting about us human beings is that we're complex, as, as I'll get out, and most of us are actually motivated by intrinsic motivation and this next one over here, uh, extrinsic motivation. So extrinsic motivation is rewards that come from outside of ourselves, okay? So if you're an extrinsically motivated person, you might wanna do your therapies because you're gonna get an external reward, something that exists outside of you. And um, praise is interesting. A lot of us are motivated by praise. I can 100% tell you, I know that I am very motivated by positive reinforcement that comes in the, in the form of praise. When you all write me and you tell me how much the information made you feel validated or it told, uh, helped you, you know, direct yourself towards better therapies, that really is my motivation for doing this because I know that there are so many unmet needs in the stroke community. And so when you help me feel that I am meeting those needs, man, that, that's really all that I need. That, that really makes me feel awesome. But you know what? There's other times too where after I get done with a tough day, I'm thinking about the cookie at the end of the day. I thought yesterday I had a long day and I thought, man, I got that chocolate peanut butter ice cream in the fridge. Once I get home, I'm gonna have a nice bowl of that. And that was my motivation to go on. So what I want you to think about is name one intrinsic motivator for yourself or your loved one and also name an extrinsic motivator, right? Because probably you have a little bit of both. You know, intrinsically, um, I know for me, a reward is going to be a sense of fulfillment. If I feel like I've done a job uh, well done, I've done it to the best of my ability, that feeling of pride definitely motivates me. So if you're a person that's oriented like that, it might feel really good to you to finish a hard 
rehab session because there is that sense of pride. You might be someone who's more wired though to need something at the end of the rehab session that's gonna boost you up. You might need that cheerleader. You might need to know that, okay, after a week of working really hard on these therapies, we're gonna go and have Thai takeout, right? It really doesn't matter what it is. I just want you to be aware of how human motivation is and the need to personalize it in a way that's unique to you. Okay, so remember before I said, have you brought music into your recovery? This is one of my favorite topics in all of the brain health communities because it is so powerful and it absolutely works. Music is very personal, it's very emotional, which makes it great for motivating. And so many times, especially when there are language issues after a stroke, uh, which mostly are focused in the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere is still perfectly great, and this is where we process things like melody. This is where we sing from the right hemisphere. If any of you have significant aphasia and you have trouble with speaking words, you probably know this already, but singing can be a very satisfying experience because of its fluency. It comes out, it's uh, articulated, it's not a struggle. Aphasia probably I think is one of the most difficult uh, post-stroke symptoms because we are such a verbally based society. It's so much a part of how we assert ourselves and how we communicate with ourselves and, and we do it so often. And when something is difficult, it's exhausting. So when I see folks with aphasia singing, it makes my heart so happy because I know they're helping their brain and it's, it's helping their recovery, but also I take so much comfort in the ease with which they are expressing themselves. And so if you haven't brought music into an aphasia recovery, oh my goodness, that is uh, a real treat. But just for anyone with any type of a stroke, music really does help with this rewiring and I wanna show you some data. So they've done a lot of research on this starting about in the mid 2000s. So they've done a lot of work with inpatient rehabs and what they know is that when music is incorporated into rehab early, people get better use of their arm back quicker, better uh, non-fluent aphasia recovery better, things like gait, which is basically walking. Oh my gosh, you guys are not gonna believe this. A giant praying mantis just jumped right in front of me. <laughs> if that thing jumps on me, you're gonna see me jump. Oh my goodness, that's good luck, right? That's supposed to be a, a omen. Okay. Whew. Okay, stroke survivors who listen to self-selected music every day for two months are less depressed and less confused. And it all comes down to this. It's about the patterns that are stimulating. Music is not a cacophony. It is not chaotic. It is organized. There's a very strong relationship between melody and rhythm exposure and reorganization of brain cells. So I want to share this one study with you because I love it. It really um, made me feel good. It made me realize that I got to tell all my patients about this. So this was done in 2008 and there were 60 stroke survivors who enrolled in the study after they were hospitalized for a major stroke. This praying mantis is like, like literally looking at me like, oh my gosh, that is so weird. Okay, um, all of the folks in the study received standard stroke care. And in addition, they took a third of them and randomly assigned them to listen to one hour a day for at least three months of music of their choice, and that's key. Another third listened to audiobooks, so they were auditorily stimulated, but it was with words, not music. And the final group wasn't given any instructions at all. So look what happened to the music listeners. Their verbal memory improved by 60% and their focused attention improved by 17%. That is powerful. One of the things I love about this study is that even folks who have difficulty with active engagement in rehab, so I'm thinking of our locked in folks, people who have global aphasia who maybe can't speak or are having trouble understanding, music can be passive. Any brain injury survivor can benefit from music as long as they can hear. So it really should be incorporated across the board. We also know that music directly impacts the nervous system, okay? The nervous system is made up of the brain, the spinal cord, and all of the different nerves that come out from it. One of the things that uh, I think is a part of um, living after a stroke is that your fight or flight system can get all messed up. So what do I mean by that? I, I'm certain 
that for many of you in the few months or perhaps even longer after a stroke, there is a real sense of waiting for the other shoe to drop, uh, fearing if you are going to have a, another stroke. Um, we've talked about this before. The definition of a traumatic event is that it came out of the blue, it was life-threatening, and you felt helpless when it was happening. That is trauma. We need to validate that. What trauma does is it messes with our parasympathetic nervous system and it makes it hard for us to let our guard down because human nature is to be prepared. That is a big thing we hear stroke survivors talk about is, and this goes for motor vehicle accident to assault to, you know, stroke, is not wanting to ever be taken by surprise again. So what we think we're doing to help ourselves is we become hyper vigilant and hyper alert to anything that remotely reminds us of when we had the event. So, you know, people sometimes will not go back to the same room where they had their stroke because it's just a normal brain association that uh, something about that room and the stroke, we don't know what it is, but I'm in survival mode and I need to avoid anything that might be a trigger. Unfortunately, in a way, this feels like it helps us psychologically in the short term. When we get to the rule about trauma, I'm going to help you understand you're doing yourself no favors by doing that. Um, but in the short term, it has a dramatic impact on our stress hormones and we start pumping out all of this adrenaline, all of this cortisol. What cortisol and adrenaline do in the body and in the brain is they increase inflammation. And if you were with me for the first rule, we talked all about blood vessels and how important it is that those blood vessels stay nice and wide open because it's all about blood flow in the brain, right? Oxygen and glucose are the fuels for our brain cells and we want a steady supply. So if we're stressed and we're in that fight or flight mode, we are pumping out all this cortisol and we are increasing our inflammation. So what music can do is the opposite. It makes the stress hormones go down and it makes the positive hormones in the brain like endorphins that make us feel good go up. Music can help regulate our breathing, our blood pressure, our heart rate. And I love this part about music. It provides predictability. This goes back to, I think, the stress and the trauma that could come along with stroke. When we know a song, part of the fun of the song is that we anticipate how the beat is going to change. We can't wait for the chorus because we know it's coming. There is a way that music can give us a security when we're at a time of our life when we're very scared about what could possibly happen next. And again, we also know that music has a direct impact on these blood vessels. So not only does it open them up, and that's good, but when blood vessels are opening, it requires a chemical called nitric oxide. And what happens with nitric oxide is that it also reduces blood clots, blood clots from forming all over the body. And as you know, that's one of the big risk factors for stroke is that the blood can get too congealed and too sticky and it doesn't flow through the blood vessels quickly and easily. So all around, okay, music really does have scientific evidence for helping with our recovery. Emotionally, music's, music is so universal, right? The whole idea of why we probably love music so much is because of our mother's heartbeat and feeling so connected to her and that being our first impression of what it's like to have a human life. Music really helps us to identify, process, and release our emotions. I am convinced because we don't focus enough on the emotional part of stroke recovery and we get so focused on the physical that the emotional stuff is getting stuffed, stuff, 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 because we are hell bent on survival and recovery and thriving. But we have to talk more about the emotional side of stroke because when it's stuffed in you, your muscles are gonna be tense, you're gonna get irritable, it's gonna mess with your sleep, and it's a distraction. Anxiety, stress, tension, trauma, you are processing it all the time. You might not be cognitively or consciously aware of it, but it will divide your attention and then you cannot focus fully on your recovery. So a big part of the stroke recovery journey we're gonna do together is validating that emotional side. Some of our rules are just all about that, okay? So stay tuned if you feel like that's something that you would benefit from. So when emotions are unexpressed, we've got more muscle tension, we've got more irritability, and then what do we often do to treat those things? We get medication. Now, I'm not against medication. I'm extremely grateful that scientists have the brain 
Uh, God has gifted them with the talents to be able to figure out compounds that alleviate human suffering. But we do want to be mindful of something we call polypharmacy. We don't want to medicate everything without first trying to get to the root cause and fix it with our behavior or fix it with the way we are living our lives. So anything we can do to get less stress hormones, less muscle tension, less inflammation, anything we can do non-pharmacologically, I'm a big fan of. Lyrics are so interesting to songs. Ever since I've been studying the psychology of music, I listen to music a little bit differently. One of the things I'm convinced music does is that it actually makes us feel like we have options. Music can teach us how to get through a stressful event. It can give us the words that give us hope when maybe we didn't have hope before. So I think music can really provide some solutions to some of the emotional dilemmas that we can be going through. It also can incredibly promote acceptance and closure. How many of us have been a little emotional? We're not quite understanding why. You listen to a song, next thing you're bawling, and then you leave the song and you're like, wow, I just feel better. You know, that happens to me every time I listen to Amazing Grace. I, I just hear it as I'm listening to the song. I always tear up. It doesn't matter, you know, where I am. And then I start to think about the things that I've overcome in my life and the grace that has been given to me. And by the time I'm done, I just have this amazing sense of accepting my life history. Look, even talking about it now, it tears me up. Uh, and it just makes me really feel um, grateful for grace. And so music can just provide, it's, it's again like, like free therapy. We also know that instrumental music uh, post-stroke can help people with uh, reducing depression. So the question to me I would wanna know is, well, what kind of music and how much music does it take? You know, I'm always a big one, like let's make this practical. How can we apply this? The key is personalization. That is uh, all about rule number two. The most evidence-based research that we have is that music is very personal. What makes me feel good might not be the kind of thing that makes you feel good. It really depends on the context. There's times where we want music to soothe us. So I imagine maybe that might be during the hospital or the acute um, rehab time. You also might want music to motivate you and make you feel kind of like sassy and strong. You know, maybe that's right before a really intense physical therapy rehab session. Music is extremely cultural. We can never assume what anyone else might like. So again, uh, when in doubt, go back to the things that the person liked before. One thing the science has taught us is that the most emotional music, if we're really trying to get someone to connect and to be present, is the music the person listened to from the time they were about 17 to 25. So you can go back and look at what the top 10 songs were during that time and maybe get a playlist going to help you uh, get back in and, and activate the brain. Many studies show superior effects with incre increased frequency, meaning the more music you listen to, the better. But there's also been studies that even, even one song, even one amazing grace can absolutely transform a person. So this is fun. I want to encourage you guys to find a recovery song have a song. What's your song, right? I put together this list of songs that I think kind of get me going. And when I'm having to do hard work and, you know, feeling like I need a little bit of a boost, these are the songs that definitely make me feel that way. Um, I tried to think about, you know, different generations and what might appeal to different people. But, you know, I, I, I dare any one of us to listen to, you know, Higher Ground by Stevie Wonder and not feel like we got this, like we are strong and we can do this. You know, ain't no mountain high enough, uh, I will survive, eye of the tiger, never gonna give you up by Rick Astley. Again, this is personal, this is your work to do. I can guide you, but you have to make this decision. But I think if you have a recovery song, you then can get into a schedule and a routine with using it, and it can really become a part of your personal motivation system. So the third way that I wanna teach you how to build on what's familiar is to personalize how you reward yourself after your therapy. So I said this before, but it bears repeating. You have to reinforce yourself. You have to reward yourself. It's very powerful, it's human, it's normal, it's natural. If you just do a hard therapy, and then you come home and you don't think of it anymore and you don't 
praise yourself or you don't do that intrinsic or that extrinsic uh, reward, then you're missing an opportunity to change your brain chemistry. So when we are rewarded, special pathways in the brain activate and they prompt us to want to do it again. So it's really, really reinforcing, not just behaviorally, but it's literally reinforcing in our brain chemistry. These rewards, these chemical activations, encourage neuroplasticity. So if you don't make a reward system part of your recovery, once again, you are missing an opportunity to enhance the recovery that you're already doing. So listening to your favorite song after a hard re rehab session is a perfectly easy and wonderful way to do this. As you are going through your recovery, I really want you to fine tune your mind, fine tune your eyes, fine tune your heart, to notice even the smallest victories. Remember what I said earlier today, this recovery is brick by brick. Okay, you are that bricklayer who is rebuilding your house. It takes time. I wish it didn't take as much time as it does, but this is a marathon, not a sprint. And rewarding yourself with every tiny little victory is very important, and it really needs to be with something that you love. And again, only you can really answer that question for yourself. So take some time after our session today, and I really want you to think about, you know, what always rewarded me before? What is it that I think would really do it for me now? And you know, people can do checklists. After I do five sessions, you know, we go and, and we do this. Uh, I'm gonna buy myself you know, a new fishing lure after I do you know, two weeks worth of speech therapy. I don't care what it is, it just matters that you give your brain that experience. And last but not least, you know, I always wanna encourage all of us after we help ourselves with, with information and empowerment, that we try to spread it into our community. And so I'd really love for you to bring this idea of personalized rehab to your medical providers and your therapists and invite them to partner with you on how you can make this recovery more personal. The reason I wanna encourage you to do this is because I really think it's up to us as a community to rise up and to let this medical system know that the way it's going now, the status quo, this idea of what rehab is, is really in need of an overhaul. It's really in need of becoming more progressive and more humane. When we person-centered rehab, to me, this is a very clear way of saying no two people are the same. Each person deserves individualized respect and every stroke recovery is going to be unique. I also love that it communicates in a very clear way that this recovery is not about the stroke. It's actually about you. And that's one of the philosophies of this I care for your brain stroke recovery journey is that this is really a journey about you. We're not going to give all the focus to the stroke. The stroke is one part of it. Of course it affects you, but at the center of this recovery truly is you as a human being. So when we hand, uh, when we send you the uh, handout this week, it's going to look a little something like this. You're going to get to go through all of those developmental timelines in your life and you're going to try to figure out how is it that you can personalize and bring in some of your past into your current recovery. So these will be sent to you guys within 24 hours. So remember, we end every session with a self-empowerment statement, and then we're going to do uh, some back and forth Q&A in a few minutes. Carrie uh, hopefully taught me how to actually uh, hear your guys' voice tonight. Um, and we, it, I love it that we have like 20 minutes we can just spend talking. That's awesome. The self-empowerment statement for this session is, I will bring more of me into my recovery starting today. I really hope that you heard what I was saying today and really took it to heart and it energizes you to realize that this has to be a customized process. You cannot accept cookie cutter rehab. You are going to bring the focus back into you and the things that you have always liked. Okay, you guys, this is the fun part. I'm super excited. Okay, we're going to do questions and answers, and hopefully I will be able to uh, answer some of these good questions. So Miss Maureen asked me, what would the content be in a neurologist follow-up or annual visit? For me, they are non-essential appointments. Am I missing something? Man, Maureen, that makes me feel so sad because those opportunities could be so rich. Those appointments could be so helpful and motivating and focusing. 
And honestly, I, I'm just going to be honest with you guys. I don't know how some doctors live with themselves that they could have someone come into their office with something as serious as a stroke and say something like, I'll see you again in six months or I'll see you again in a year. You know, call me if that keeps happening. Um, well, you know, I don't know what to tell you. This is where you're at. You know, you did, you did nine sessions of speech therapy and you know, this is as good as it gets. Um, that really, really makes me mad and it really makes me pissed off. Um, you know what I would say, Maureen, is try to find a new neurologist, believe it or not. There are neurologists who are a very comprehensive and take your complaints seriously and they actually care. It might take you a while to find one, but I would actually really encourage you to do that. But let's just say you don't have a choice and here you are. The function of these appointments is supposed to be to um, make sure you haven't had another stroke, to make sure you're on top of secondary stroke prevention, which is you know, what's the risk factor that got you to have the stroke in the first place and are they on top of it? Um, but you know, neurologists aren't necessarily rehab experts. You know who's really the rehab expert is a physiatrist who not a lot of people see. So physiatrists are the doctors who run inpatient rehab units. So before I was in private practice, as some of you know, I was up the road at uh, Uni uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill School of Medicine, and I was in the inpatient stroke unit. And we were run by physiatrists, and it was good. Physiatrists are experts in physical medicine and rehabilitation. They not only are good uh, evaluators, but they actually have a plan of action like, you know, they're the ones who really understand Botox. They understand um, the gear side of stroke rehab, you know, um, AFOs and orthotics and prosthetics. Um, but they also can get people to neuropsychology. You might want to try to get a consultation with a physiatrist and uh, see if that serves you any better. Okay, um, let me see. Oh, Jerry, you got a question for me. Jerry was so awesome to let me um, read his CT scan today and he's gonna get his MRI um, for us. Um, you're welcome, Jerry, thank you so much. And just to give Jerry a good promo here, he's an awesome stroke survivor, has really used his experience to try to help other people. And he's got a great Facebook group called Let's Talk Stroke, Strive for Greatness. So if um, you're on Facebook, I think that would be awesome for you to get on there. Okay, uh, can you show us the praying mantis? Oh my God, you guys, I can't find it, which ter <laughs> terrifies me. Oh my God, it's not in the same place it was before. <laughs> Oh my God. You're funny though, Jerry. Okay. All right. Miss Joe Francis. So Joe, you were open about this before. So I hope you don't mind me sharing this. Joe is an amazing caregiver whose husband has locked in syndrome as we were talking about before. And she just um, is writing here that her husband's in the hospital. Oh no. He has low sodium. We believe from not enough calories. Um, lost 30 pounds in a year. Now we believe his Celexa is too high of a dose. So depression talk is what I need to hear. Let's talk about sodium for a second, Joe, because sodium, potassium, these are just these very basic, um, you know, uh, chemicals that are in the body. And when they get just a little bit low or a little bit high, we can have very significant mental status changes. So this is where people can have uh, if you don't have epilepsy, some people can have a seizure because of this. You can have kind of sudden confusion. Um, and so this is why hydration is really, really important and making sure that you see your primary care physician on a regular basis. So that way, just your general health can be attended to. Sometimes we get so focused on the brain and on neurology, we really forget that the rest of our health is what is supporting the brain. And so I really want you all to be very cognizant about your blood sugar levels, um, your nutrition, you know, how much water you drink, just something uh, little like your, your sodium, uh, let's just say it's to be at 20. If it gets down to 18, you can have a very significant mental status change. And the problem is if it goes too low, it's not as easy as giving someone an IV with sodium or giving them you know, Gatorade or something with salt because we really don't want the sodium, especially as it relates to the brain, to go up too quickly because the brain can't handle that and we can actually have 
uh, something called a herniation in the brain, and it really does affect the back part of the brain a little bit more, Joe, where you know your husband had his uh, unfortunate stroke. So uh, I'm sure they know that in the hospital, don't worry about that. Um, so what they're gonna try to do is it usually takes about two days to get sodium back up because they're just drip, 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 just wanting to put it into the brain uh, slowly. But I do hope that he's getting better. And honestly, Joe, use this time when he's in the hospital as a, a leverage to get him into that inpatient rehab to start working on his communication. I shared with you all last time, uh, Joe's husband has been making these like almost unheard of improvements with his locked in communication and he is actually able to yes, no communicate. Um, there's been some little bit of laughing, a little bit of smiles, but this man needs to be put back into an inpatient rehab so we can push on that and get him all the communication that he can possibly get. Um, and, and that unfortunately is very, complicated right now because of COVID, but he's already in the hospital system, Joe. So please get in touch with the unit social worker, try to have a conversation with the neurologist and just really, really respectfully, assertively ask them that he please be transferred to an acute inpatient rehab so he can build on the strengths that you've been able to get going in him on his own at home, okay? Maureen also said, uh, me and other stroke patients I know act as our own physiatrist. You are so right. Finding someone to oversee our plan of care seems to be chasing a unicorn. God, I know that that is so true. I know that I am just one person, but I do truly believe that neuropsychologists uh, are as close to this unicorn besides a physiatrist that you might get. Yes, we are not experts in spasticity. We're not experts in um, you know, visual field loss, but we can absolutely assess the cognitive piece, the mental health piece, give you that map. Where is it you're at now and where exactly is it that I think you could go in the future? If you have had a stroke and you have not seen a neuropsychologist, please, please, please get a referral. You can email me and Carrie and we can tell you someone as uh, who's board certified, who's close to your area. Um, you know, I don't know every neuropsychologist in the United States, but um, if you tell me who you're seeing, I would be more than happy to send them an email and kind of personalize the interaction um, so that, you know, there's just that extra layer, layer of connection. Um, I, I really think that um, that is a must for every single person that has had a stroke. But I believe you, Maureen. Honestly, that's why I went to Facebook about three years ago and just started doing a weekly free lecture because my thought was, I have to do something. I can't live with myself if I know that people are out there not getting better due to a lack of education or support, and I can offer that for free through Facebook. And I think that's part of why it's it's been a success is because, um, frankly, the failure of the medical system to do the right thing and, and provide comprehensive stroke care. But you know, I have to tell you, I said this before. I would talk about this. I honest to God think it's changing. So I, um, I, I get to sit in on some uh, conference calls with you know, important organizations and they talk about what should be done. And you know, Carrie and I are pushing hard to get the Stroke Recovery Guide to be a standard um, educational material that every stroke survivor gets at discharge. We have been able to do that in our personal community at First Health Hospital because my thought is, even if people just had that, even if they had 10 rules of rehab that they could apply, we would have less people feeling lost. We would have less people feeling like they had been thrown off a bridge, right? Um, because of that, having the book, it's kind of taken us into a few, oh God, there's the praying mantis. Oh God, he's walking up my computer. Oh my gosh. You know what? I'm going to take a picture and then I'm going to post it for you guys later. Oh Lord. Oh my God, you know, I have to reverse my thinking on this though. Oh God, this has to be a good sign, right? This means we're doing good work and, and we're, we're healing and we're educating, right? The praying mantis is here to tell me that. Oh gosh. Oh, I'm so embarrassed that I'm freaking out too. Okay, I'm gonna show you guys that picture later. Oh! Okay. Um, yes, you do all have to be the, the masters of your rehab, but you know what I wish is that you had a partner. I do believe, oh God, I do believe in um, self-directed care. Um, even if you had a medical partner, I, I do think, you know, it's your life 
you're going to put more into it than anyone else. And I would um, really encourage you to take that responsibility. It's not always possible. You, of course, you know, need care partners, um, you know, including me. That's why I'm here. I'm volunteering for the job. Um, but uh, it certainly takes a lot of organization and initiative to stay on top of stroke recovery. That is absolutely true. Oh, my God. This praying mantis is going to be the end of me. All right. Um, Joe says we need health insurance reform. Oh my gosh. I just read yesterday that a part of Joe Biden's platform, he's come out talking about how to rebuild America. And I was so pleased to see that one of the things he wants to do is to pay caregivers. And I mean, if we can't get some clapping on that, I mean, that is one of the biggest crimes against humanity that we do in this country is Many people cannot work because they have to take care of someone. They want to do it out of the kindness of their heart, but financially it is absolutely devastating to not have that income anymore. And so the fact that we don't just have a national system that pays caregivers to me is despicable. So based on that alone, uh, I'm very, very supportive of that agenda. And if you are too, I would definitely talk about that on your social media. Jerry is asking me, uh, he has seizures um, that can happen after a stroke because um, <sighs> seizures are complicated and they happen for a variety of reasons, but they're um, related to brain irritability. When the brain has been damaged in some way, um, oftentimes the electricity that happens in that part of the brain um, just goes a little bit haywire and we get a stroke. Um, and so people then have to take anti-seizure medications in order to not have seizures because seizures, because of their electricity, can damage parts of the brain. So Jerry's question is, should I talk to my neuro and ask him to do some blood work to see if I can get off of this? Oh, Jerry. Unfortunately, no, because even though anti-seizure medications stink because they make you so tired, it probably is protecting your brain. And I know just from, um, I think, I think you didn't have a stroke uh, too, too far ago. And so what you have to do is be seizure free for a relatively long period of time, maybe like a year, two years. And then you can start the process, not of getting off the Keppra, but of slowly going down on the Keppra. The worst thing you would want to do is cold turkey yourself off any brain related drug, but also Keppra in particular, because you can initiate a seizure, okay? So I know that those drugs can make you tired. They absolutely have some cognitive side effects. You can feel like your processing speed is not as sharp. Um, unfortunately, the alternative is having a seizure and then having permanent brain damage from the seizure. So I'm sorry to say, you probably need to stick on that for a while. All right, we got like seven or eight minutes back here. Spell what you are saying that sounds the same as a podiatrist, Tamala. Isn't that so funny? I know that. And it also sounds like a psychiatrist. So a physiatrist is P Y, no, P H Y S I A T R I S T, physiatrist. Um, just as one example, if you look up UNC School of Medicine, Physical Medicine and Rehab, you can look, just because I know those guys, you can look at um, some of the um, bios there and just kind of see the things that they offer. So like I said, they typically run things like Botox um, clinics, uh, spasticity clinics, uh, you know, um, they help people, you know, if you have a hole in your heart and you had an embolic stroke, they are the ones that help you get connected to the right cardiologist. Um, they are, I, I really, I hadn't worked with physiatrists before UNC. I was downright impressed with them because it's more in that practical application of medicine. It's not so much like they didn't have as much of a hierarchy and you know, I have many of awesome neurologist friends in my life. I am not trying to bag on neurology. I'm simply uh, responding to the stereotype of a neurologist. And so sometimes neurologists can be up here and here's the patient down here. 
I despise this. The way it should work is yes, I am an expert, but my God, so are you. I always hope you guys get that from me. I have not had a stroke yet. Um, I don't have that level of expertise, you do. And you teach me just as much as I teach you. The whole idea of, to me, the modern day doctor is that we should be operating like this, sharing information back and forth, respecting each other, communicating, listening to each other. In my experience, physiatrists really did this the best. They impressed me the most in the medical community. Um, so yeah, by all means, go online and try to find one um, near you guys. Oh my gosh, you guys, I can't wait to post this picture. So what we're gonna do uh, the next time we're together is we are going to be talking about rule number three, which is repetition and consistency. This is basically like, how do I do my, my exercises, right? What is the amount of times I should be doing them per day, per week, what's the schedule, what's the research behind that, um, how is it that I can overcome that neuro fatigue that plagues so many of us. I think 80% of stroke survivors say they have it, even upwards as three years after a stroke, people with stroke complain that mental and physical fatigue is a significant barrier to their care. Um, we're going to be talking all about uh, why people have neuro fatigue and what you can do about it. So that's going to be next Thursday, October 1st at 4 p.m. If you haven't signed up for that, I would love for you guys to join us um, at the website icareforyourbrain.com backslash SRG. We um, are going to be sending you the link to this lecture tonight and the handout within 24 hours, courtesy of Carrie. Um, I really appreciate this time with you guys tonight. I was looking forward to this all week. Um, like I said, you're more than welcome to send me an MRI report or a CT scan report. Let me know if you want me to help you understand it privately or if I'm welcome uh, to talk about it publicly. I am gonna start every group by talking about um, a report just because I think that would be a helpful service to demystify all this neuro talk. Again, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I am gonna post a picture of this praying mantis uh, on Facebook in a few minutes so you can see what I've been dealing with this entire time. <laughs> thank you guys so much and I really appreciate being here with you uh, significantly. Thank you, bye-bye.